Uh, did I just see a cat's tail up there? Uh, yes, you might see a cat coming. Nice. We have we have three of them roaming around here somewhere, so you might also see a cat. <laughs> every uh, three. every Zoom meeting has a mascot these days. Exactly. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, hello. Hi. Nice to meet you. I'm Brian Colley. Nice to meet you. I'm Andrew Simonian. Oh, there's one. There's the cat. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> right on cue. Uh, how are you? Fine. And how are you? Doing all right. Doing all right. I, I, I uh, went through our whole house with my computer to pick the best spot for the Zoom, and this is what I landed on. So so this is my, my set dressing capabilities. So you're looking at it. Looks all right to me. Um, and and you're in Los Angeles. I am. Okay. Why the Kansas City Film Fest? Or are you just trying to get your film out there, or was there a specific reason? Um, I mean, uh, I'm new to the whole festival circuit, so I was just kind of researching festivals, and you know, it's a whole wide world out there. It turns out, so you know, on on those websites that aggregate like a film freeway, etc. You know, I didn't know, but there's like a hundred million different festivals out there. So you know, and some are like fly by the seat of their pants sounding kind of things. Um, and so you kind of look into those and try and understand what they are. And then there are the really well established and clearly more, you know, at least well respected real events. And, and, you know, in looking at Kansas City, that's kind of the sense I got. So I read up on it as much as I could and kind of did my ability to research, you know, its history and kind of, you know, it has a very storied, respected, like I said, history. And so you know, those are the ones you want to try to get into. And so it's kind of, again, I'm learning as I go, because this is my first feature, but you kind of have to do both because if you only apply to the really big, well-respected ones, you might get into none. Uh, but if you only apply to the little ones that no one's ever heard of, nobody might care. And I'm trying to figure out kind of that balance a little bit. And uh, and so far it's been, it's been great. As you can see here, that's, this is our 25th anniversary. I'm not good at this. I'm not a weatherman. <laughs> you can't be a weatherman anytime soon, that's true. Our 25th anniversary, yeah, we've been a while. So, so welcome to the Kansas City Film Fest. We're happy to have your film here. Uh, even you. though it's an online film festival, we wish everyone was here in person, but they're not. So, but now we got people from all over the world at our film exactly. festival. Exactly. And it's pretty exactly. cool. Bigger audience. So why don't you tell everyone a little bit about yourself, because I'm sure they're curious. And uh, yeah, just kind of your background, because I know you've been in the business uh, for quite some time. Sure. Uh, well, I grew up on the East Coast, uh, mainly outside Philadelphia, uh, where, you know, the idea of Hollywood or making movies or television didn't really cross my mind. I certainly consumed a lot of it, but I never stopped to think that people actually made it, you know, like didn't Channel 29 make what's happening that I would watch after school or whatever. Um, you know, I, I never really stopped to think about it. And um, I ended up going to Penn, uh, which is in Philadelphia, and I was a business major. I was a finance major at the Wharton School, and that was kind of the, the path I was going on. And then I met some kids that I became really good friends with from L.A., and they grew up completely differently than I did. And so, you know, one of my good friends was always wanted to be a director. You know, that's kind of what he knew. He grew up here, and, and, and that was his thing. And suddenly it just seemed more real, like, oh, people do actually do this. And I started looking into it, and it's, you know, it's, it's a real career path, and people actually spent a lot of time doing stuff. And it's, it's, you know, it's a big part of the industry out here, a big part of the community in LA. So I kind of changed paths. I ended up finishing my finance degree, but I ended up moving out here to LA right after school just to get started in the business that I didn't really know very well at all. Uh, and so I, you know, kind of kicked around writing small things, uh, making little projects for whoever would have me, and then ended up uh, starting to work at the William Morris Agency. So I worked as an assistant at WMA at the time uh, this is well before the merger with Endeavor, um, and fell into the reality TV department. So it was not a world I really expected to be a part of, and it was kind of just starting. So this is like after the first season of Survivor, you know, they're on season like 40, whatever now. So, uh, and I hadn't watched Survivor. So I, you know, at the time it was just starting to, to happen in the United States. They didn't even call it the, the reality or unscripted division yet. It was still the syndication department. Um, but I kind of fell into that and got a foothold there and, and um, started meeting everyone and realizing it was kind of an exciting little world that was just starting. And um, I knew I didn't want to be an agent. So I stayed there for, for you know, a couple of years, the way you're supposed to as an assistant, meeting people, et cetera. And then I jumped out of the agency, went to a production company, started running development for different companies, 
um, and uh, ended up at Fox uh, Television Studios where I was a VP. And then after I left Fox, I started my own company. And so I've been on the reality TV side for a while as the core kind of business of what we do. We expanded into uh, mobile applications with teams kind of, uh, you know, first in the US and then Canada and then India and now Pakistan. So we make mobile applications and I had a book published and I have a, because I was a ward in finance, I have a consulting side to what I do. Uh, so kind of a lot of balls in the air all the time uh, as you need to do in Hollywood. Um, but I always, you know, I had moved out here to get into movies. That was really the initial dream. And then, like I said, I just kind of fell into a different side of the business and, and had a foothold there. And that's where the career path kind of took me. Um, and that's how I kind of finally pulled the trigger on making this movie. Ah. Um, which started as a short, as we saw in the credits, uh, the way you recreated the short. So, um, so you kind of made this short film, I assume just for fun or just as a project? Yeah, I did that at Penn. Um, it was kind of the first real thing I'd ever made. Um, I had some time or, or desire to do it. And so I kind of came up with this idea based on a long story of why and how I came up with this idea, called in some friends. You know, I, I got in, interested in at, um, entertainment, not just because of speaking with friends, but we started a TV show while I was on campus at Penn. Uh, and it kind of took over my life. So, you know, I was still doing all finance, accounting, all these classes, but the bulk of my free time was built around me and three friends who had started this television show on the university's like local cable network or whatever you would call it that no one ever watched. But we created this thing that, that was really fun. It was terrible. I mean, now that you look back at it, you know, we didn't know what we were doing. It was all volunteer student actors. We assembled a writer's room because we'd heard you're supposed to, you know, but we didn't know what that meant. And so we had writers writing stuff for us. Then we would read it and be like, this is terrible. And we would rewrite our own stuff. You know, it was just like a mess, but it was super fun. And so I, you know, I got a lot of kind of very hands-on writing, directing, producing, editing experience there. And so I was able to use that experience and that equipment, uh, pens, you know, cameras and stuff. Although it was like the oldest, worst equipment ever. So like, this is... 1997, not to date myself too much. Um, and it was like SVHS cameras. You know, we had friends at other universities, Duke, et cetera, that were like making these things and they look great. And we were like, what are you guys doing? Why does yours look so much better than ours? And they were already using DV and all this stuff and, and like uh, digital editing. And we were literally shooting on these giant SVHS, like home recording looking cameras. And uh, we were de editing on a deck to deck, one deck to deck editing reel so you were losing a generation like every time you edited every time you made a copy like it was the it was great for learning because you really had to be decisive and and you really had to plan ahead and it was you know you didn't have a lot of wiggle room because the technology wasn't there to support being wishy-washy but it was like it was a devastating thing because sometimes the machine would go haywire and just like edit over a day's worth of editing that you had just done you know it was like it was a real kind of trial by fire learning experience it's a long way of saying so i wanted to make this movie i had already been doing it in terms of the TV show, which was kind of like making a movie every time we made an episode because it was such a big endeavor for us. So I kind of had some friends, actors, actresses, et cetera, had the equipment, et cetera. But I kind of I just made that kind of on a whim uh, and it came together really well. I was really happy with it. I never really did very much with it, but everyone who saw it seemed to like it quite a bit. And how did that turn into a feature film? So uh, like I said, I moved out here. I always wanted to make features and I had this hole coming up in my schedule. And I'd always told people, you know, while I was doing all the TV stuff, you know, I think I think I could make with with what I know about production, I think I could make a really cheap movie. And people are like, yeah, you know, half a million dollars, you can make an inexpensive movie. And I was like, yeah, but that's great to say, but it's still half a million dollars. Like, I understand it's a cheap movie in the grand scheme of things, but you know, I'm some reality TV producer who people on the movie side of the business don't know. So no one's gonna give me half a million dollars to make a movie, they're just not, that's not how it works. Um, I think I can make a movie for like $5,000. And people were like, you don't know what you're talking about, you're an idiot. And I was like, well, I'm too busy anyway, it doesn't matter, fine. So, you know, again, it was TV, 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 apps, whatever. And then finally I had this hole coming up in my schedule and I was like, you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a feature. And so I had this window of shooting that I kind of had to hit because I was like gonna shoot it at my house, this house. Um, in fact, if you see the movie, this couch is in the movie. Um, and my, I have a wife and two kids and they were gonna, I kind of arranged or they were gonna go on a trip to see my wife's family up in San Francisco for like a week in August or whatever. So I was like, okay, that's my window, my shooting window and when, when I can do it. So I kind of had to back into that and I didn't have that much time. It was already like March or whatever. 
So I kind of was toying with ideas. What can I write? I need, I was writing to shoot something contained, writing for something kind of in one location based on what I knew I had access to. And I kind of came back to the short saying, I really loved that. It worked really well. It's a really fun kind of idea. It was very contained. I could make that a feature. And so that's how I kind of landed on an idea, a little bit of out of necessity, because I was like, it's already kind of a formed idea. I don't have that much time and it's something I know I can shoot, um, et cetera. So that's how I landed on an idea. I wrote something really quick into a feature and then called in every favor, you know, imaginable, the, 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 the typical kind of credo of the independent filmmaker. So I had a friend uh, who's a you know great guy and he's a DP. He had, he had the equipment, he had cameras, he had sound equipment. He agreed to shoot it for me. I had a friend of a friend do casting. We found this cast of people who were unknown, but great and really nice. And we all got along and it was amazing. And so when production time came, actually everything went off, like in the way you never expect, like everything went right. So it was kind of crazy. Like usually it's Murphy's law and everything that can go wrong will go wrong. You know this, everybody who's listening to this and has the interest in hearing anything about this probably knows that how that goes having done it themselves. And it was unbelievable how lucky we were with production. So like, you know, we're shooting in my house. I live in the city of Los Angeles. There's houses, you know, on either side of us, whatever, 20 feet away, all the way up the street. And the house right next door to us had been torn down. It was under construction. So it's like jackhammer, crane, crane, you know, whatever, the construction noise every day. And I was calling the contractor who had bought it and I was building the spec who I didn't know, but I'd gotten to know a little bit. And I was like, hey, what's your timing? When do you think? He's like, oh, you know, we'll be done by August. That's our hope. But construction never ends on time. So I'm calling the guy all the time, we're getting ready to go. And I'm listening in my living room and it's like, it's like the windows are open. We're in this old house for the, you know, it's not soundproof at all. It's from the 1940s, this house. And so it was like they were jackhammering in our living room. And I was like, I don't know, we'll get, you know, we're just gonna have to make it work. I guess we'll like loop the whole thing if we have to, you know, whatever. And then the, the day we started recording, the construction went silent. Like they started like tiling the interior of the house. Not for me, the guy was certainly not gonna, update his, you know, multi-million dollar construction schedule for me. It was just the movie God smiled on us. And so that kind of thing kept happening. You know, we were really lucky with who we got. We were really, I mean, I could go into all the minutia of this and it's a bunch of million crazy stories, but like the people we got, the locations came through kind of within reason, almost everything worked as well as we could have. And so production went great. We were really happy with it. Post took forever. Um, I had someone lined up to edit. She ended up getting like a real job and disappeared, uh, which I totally understood. And then I got another guy who was like gonna edit it and it took him and I, about a year to do a rough cut. So, because he was very busy and had a real job and he was like an up and coming editor guy. I was very, very busy. I was through the consulting side of my business at the time running a healthcare company actually, in addition to all the, the, the media stuff. And I finally got the rough cut after about a year and it was good, but it had taken him forever. And I have really specific, ideas and I was like I could either give this kid you know a thousand page document of notes or I just need to do it myself and so I just took the editing over but again I was very busy and, and editing a feature I'd never done before was very daunting um, and every decision just seemed like the most important decision in the world and so it took me a long time to finish it because I was finishing it kind of in my spare time but it came together really well but it took forever and so um, we ended up finally finishing the film I'm very happy with it it's a 74 minute kind of R-rated, very fast-paced, kind of action-y comedy. Um, and the whole thing cost $3,500 to make, which if anyone's ever tried to make a movie, they know that's very little money. Um, and the bulk of that was like feeding people and, and, and whatever the little unavoidable things you need to do. And so, you know, I'm very happy with it, uh, especially considering how we made it. And, and the $3,500 budget, it has kind of worked to be the conversation starter I was hoping it would be, you know, if you make a movie for $2 million, people will be like, that's great. You know, is Kevin Hart in it? Like whatever, they don't really care. Um, but if you can make a movie for 3,500 bucks, which we were able to do, it at least makes people sit up a little bit and be like, wait, what? Like, what does that even mean? How do you, how could you do that? What could that possibly look like? I at least need to see it. So it kind of makes people perk up and there's at least the conversation started. The movie still needs to be good, obviously. And I believe that it is. Um, but at least there's, a, there's something to hang your hat on or a little bit of a hook into why you might be interested in seeing this movie. And so far that's that's played out well and, and kind of grabbed people's attention a little bit the way I was hoping it would. Well, we certainly get to know your house really well. I think we just go about every every square foot of it. <laughs> pretty much. Ground floor is pretty well, well covered, yeah. 
and the backyard and the and the mm -hmm. garage and everything is there. So your house is well featured in the film. Um, yes. And it's a nice, bright and colorful kind of movie. It's a new, it, uh, it doesn't feel like it's confined in any way. Right. That was that was certainly in, at least attempting to be intentional in terms of like, I didn't want it. It was kind of all shot here, you know, 80% of it was shot in and around my house, if not more, 90% of it. But I didn't want it to feel that way. And so it, I think it certainly feels a little bigger than it actually is, which is nice, you know, breaks up, breaks up the location a little. Um, yeah, there's a lot of variety. I, I think I was sold on your movie. When I started watching it, I think I finally got sold on it when she explained that uh, it wasn't her house, that she was just renting a room. Because you sit there and you Yeah, watch, I put that in there. <laughs> you watch these films. It's, a, it's, a, big it's not a small house. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's not, you know, friends, how do they, how do they, afford those apartments <laughs> i wanted to avoid that question and so those little things i think are important and i thought of and she sticks it in there just kind of expositionally a little bit but yeah i didn't want it to be like why is this not only why does she have this house but why is she in this weird bedroom on the first floor that you know if it was her house that wouldn't really make sense necessarily either so it's kind of like it all just kind of came together with a, a little bit of reasoning that yeah for that kind of thought i was like oh someone thought of that and made an excuse for it and it worked and and i was on board with the movie after that why don't All you right. tell us about these uh three actors you've got well there's four actors but three main actors yeah three main three main actors uh and then there's a fourth and then there's actually the, the fifth, fifth the, yeah fifth there's the young lady at the coffee shop who has a few lines who was also great um so they're great i'd never met them before like i said i had a friend of a friend do casting she's based in florida um, but you know, she, she knows the world and it was a world I didn't really know anything about in terms of feature film casting. So she put it all online on all these websites that I've since learned, you know, everyone scours if you're an actor and you're looking for all these, these projects. Um, you know, it's tricky because we were a feature, which I think, um, might've been more enticing to some people, but you learn very quickly that it might not be. Cause you would think like, okay, if I'm an up and coming actor and I want credits, right? Like you need to get cast and it's this incredibly difficult process cause everyone's an up and coming actor in LA and like, how do you get someone to cast you in their project so you can get a reel in the next project, right? Um, so I thought, okay, a feature is much better than a short, some college short, whatever, cause people do that stuff all the time but it's also a bigger commitment. And especially for a film like mine where everyone's working for free and trying to get a piece of, you know, God willing, there's some sort of success, you know, they, what's interesting is the actors didn't even expect a piece of it, because it's like so LA that they're just dying to get roles. Uh, they were just willing to do it. But I was like, no, at least if there's some success, you know, I offered them a small piece of the movie, which I think was you know, the least I could do. Um, but they weren't even expecting that. I and mean, surprisingly, I think they're so dying to, to get, you know, some, some credits. Um, but it's a bigger commitment, like I said. So a feature in some ways, some people might say, great, it's a big, bigger credit, but it might also be like, look, if I shoot a short, it's two days out of my life. And this was, you know, originally we thought like a week ended up being like 15 days, but like five of them were half days. And like two of those were walking around the city, shooting all those city scenes, mm -hmm. scenes that you've probably seen on screen. If no, you haven't seen it yet, you know what I'm talking about, but you'll recognize it. So it was a, you know, but it was like, we were doing a lot of fighting and, you know, it was hot outside and they were burning up and it was, it was a big commitment. So I was excited to see what we were going to get. I realized later that the woman who cast it, I guess, because it's, it was kind of like a non-paying job. You have to file it that way. There might've been no feature option for non-paying. So it was listed as a short film. So the whole thing kind of got messy because the people who even responded thought they were responding to a short film. So I, I think I got less people responding because of that. I think if it had been a feature, people would have given more interest or the people who applied ended up being like, eh, I don't even wanna waste my time with this. Um, but we got really lucky because I got, it was a small cast and I got amazing people I thought. And, and it was kind of like, I never really cast a feature before. So I was in charge, she was in Florida, the woman who was helping me. So she wasn't physically here. She helped set it up all online, but I was the one kind of trying to figure out like, okay, how do I meet these people? This is pre-pandemic luckily, but you know, where do I do casting? How, what's the process? You know, I kind of made it up as I went along. I was casting them in my backyard and trying to, you know, you're also asking like young women you don't know to like come to some address and like <laughs> walk into your backyard. So like, you know, I made sure to have other people there and the woman who was helping us uh, on the crew side who I'd, already, who I'd already met. And that's a whole long story. Uh, I made sure she was there. So at least it was, you know, people were comfortable, but um, you know, I found a few people I really liked, um, and and luckily these were the three people I liked 
the most. And so it's um, Jeremy Sless and Nick Grace and Alexander Miles. Um, and they were all willing and very excited and able and game. And, and part of it was also trying to find people I thought we'd all want to spend a half a month together killing each other every day because it's obviously a stressful uh, process. Although luckily it was a really easy going set. Everyone got along. I try to make it fun and, 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 you know, I'm not, I'm certainly not any sort of yeller. Um, but you know, you got to make sure it's not, you never know who it's a little bit of a marriage. And so, so we got, again, we just got lucky where the people who I thought they were from small interactions, we were able to have watching tape, meeting them in person a little bit, uh, they ended up being great. So, so it all worked out. Yeah. I thought they were terrific and, and they had a lot of chemistry together. Like they mm -hmm. had been working together for a long time and, uh, is what it seemed to me like they knew each other well. And, uh, yeah. we had one rehearsal funny. day. We had one rehearsal day before we started shooting. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that really came together because there was camaraderie there, especially between the two guys who, you know, yeah. they yeah. spent 30, 30% 30 of the movie, I think, fighting each other. <laughs> Probably. Yeah. And neither of them had experience with that. You know, again, during casting, I had to maybe do minimal, like, just to see if I could make it look realistic and they were good enough, but neither of them had training or, or anything like that. You know, they're certainly not Jackie Chan. But, but, you know, you can make it work. And, and that was part of the benefit of having shot the short. So I don't know if you, if you noticed or not, but I was in, I was in, uh, I was in the short. I don't know if you know that, but in the short film at the end, I'm the guy in the red shirt. And again, that's me when I'm like 20 years old or whatever. Um, so I was really familiar with how to make it work. You know what I mean? Like I knew I could make the fight scenes work. I had not only shot them before, but and edited them before, but I had been in them before. And you know, I'm an, I was an athletic enough guy at that age, but I wasn't particularly well-trained karate guy either. So like, and neither was my friend who was the other guy in the movie. So um, I knew, uh, you know, with reasonable athleticism, I could, it, it, it would work, you know, cause I'd already proven it 20 years earlier. So, so that was also a little bit of a safeguard. And it's interesting that you not just, you didn't just redo the short film, but you, from what it, you showed, it was basically recreating it shot by shot. Some of it, yeah. And again, that was because I had already done some of it. You know, the short the short film is about twenty minutes long. This movie is seventy four minutes long, so it, it's quite a bit more. But the parts that were the first, you know, fifteen minutes or whatever, and then some of the fighting was already I had shot it before, and it had worked. And and there was no real reason to just make it completely different. And so some of it is really really similar because. Oddly, the configuration of my house even matched that apartment that I was shooting in in the, you know, <laughs> West Philadelphia. And so it just, I, it ended up matching exactly in some ways, uh, which was kind of funny when I noticed it, which is why I put it in the credits that way. They just kind of be like, I've always liked that. You know, if it's, if it's a movie about real people, when they show the actual footage of the real people and next to the actor, you're like, oh, it's like, I get it. They see they look similar, they don't look similar, whatever, or when they, whenever they do anything like that, I've always really enjoyed it. It's just kind of a peek behind the curtain. So I was excited to do that in our credits. And yeah, some of it's very similar. Hmm. Which makes, uh, which you think, I mean, a viewer might think a lot of the, your script, a lot of the action in the script was improvised on the spot, but it's, but showing it that way made it show like this was all very planned out and, and organized. And I wondered how well, much improvisation there was going yeah, on. Yeah, I mean, there was not that much improvisation, even, even dialogue wise. Um, you know, we didn't have that much time and and whatever. So there was definitely a little bit of leeway, but um, if something funnier happened, we would certainly keep it, but it was pretty much the script. It was the script, um, not in any precious way, but it was kind of like, you know, it was working and they were able to do it and and it was good. And then fighting wise, yeah, there's not room for any improvisation, to be honest, because not only are we, were they not professionals, I designed, I choreographed everything. And again, I knew it would work, but you know, if someone, imp, quote, improvises in the middle of a fight, that means that they don't duck when they're supposed to duck and they're going to get punched in the face for real. So yeah, they're, they're improvising. I mean, we would potentially sh stop something if we tried it a few times and it wasn't working and we would adjust it. Going, okay, all right, that's not, you know, that it's too complicated. It doesn't look real, whatever. So, Hey, let's do this, but it wouldn't be on the fly. We would then, you know, have a couple of minutes to practice that and then, and then shoot it. And what's great about movies is everyone knows it's like, unlike theater, which I also don't know that well, but the one thing I do know is you only need to get it once really. 
So they can mess up those fights a hundred times. No one knows. You would just see the one that looks good. So, you know, you have the ability to kind of fake it till you make it a little. It's true. Um, you mentioned her walking around. So, so he's stalking her at the beginning, beginning of the film and he's following her around LA. I'm just curious, how far did she walk? Because she's going from site to site all over town. Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, that's obviously a little bit of just a creative freedom there. Um, because I don't know if you know LA at all, but yeah, those things are not near each other at all. Like, it makes no sense. If, if you were plotting it on a map, it would make no sense. You know, I mean, she would, especially in LA where people don't walk, you know, very famously, nobody walks more than five minutes unless you're going on a hike. She would have to walk for two days to to see all those sites, but they are kind of the, you know, the the emblematic sites of of LA, you know, the Hollywood sign and Man's Chinese Theater and Rodeo Drive and whatever. So um, that's why it took, you know, it took us two days just to shoot because we couldn't physically do it because it was driving, 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 parking, finding it, making it work. You know, I was like, we'll never do this in one day. So we even did kind of two half days of that, uh, you know, in a weird pattern. And that was, you know, obviously we we're shooting with no permits. And, and, you know, I think if you are in some towns or cities, no one's going to care because you're in Smallville, whatever. And, you know, people might even be excited to see a movie, but LA is LA. Like they're not going to mess around. They want you to have a permit. So we were shooting. Kansas City doesn't care. So, yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because it's not a commonplace thing, but here they do. Uh, so, you know, basically we, we shot on a DSLR. So, and, and what's interesting also is on, I think both of those days, if not one of them, but I think both of those days were the only days my DP couldn't be there. So he gave me the cameras, the camera, and, and I didn't even use a tripod because I didn't want it to look like we were doing anything. And it was literally like me and the two actors. And sometimes like our, our associate producer PA was there with us, but I wanted to look like, a, you know, we're all the same age, but family vacation kind of like, you know, it was just me taking pictures it looked like, cause I was just going like this. Um, but I'd never shot on that camera before. And so it was like, I was terrified. It was all going to be out of focus or overexposed or like, you know, the, the amount of attention I had to pay to the settings on that camera was like overwhelming for me because I was so worried it was going to, we were going to do it all. And then, you know, when I look in the computer, I'd be like, Oh, like, what are we going to go reshoot it again? You know, like whatever. Um, so that's when I learned to really appreciate you know, some people love that and they're like, I shot it and directed it. Like I would never be able to do that because the, the amount of attention was already, I was already producing it and, and everything also, you know, I was in charge of like kind of everything. If I had shot it, the whole thing would have crumbled. Like it would never have worked because it, it's not my, my thing, but I did do those two days and they look pretty good. So I was very proud of myself. There's always going to be someone wants to know what kind of gear you used, cameras and yes. stuff. If you yes. know. I, yeah, I do. Um, I have a whole bit about gear that I don't know if you want to use, but like my, my thought on that is that it's not as important to me as it is to a lot of other people who are filmmakers. When I first moved out here to LA in my early twenties, we were all making shorts or trying to help other people make shorts, you make friends, whatever, and you all try to help each other. And someone, what I noticed was someone would be like, dude, I just shot a short. And the first question everyone asked them, would be like, what'd you shoot it on? Always, first question, always. And I shot it on a red, man, we got this package, whatever. And I was always like, I get it, I guess, but like, I, who cares? Like, the, the, like you care and a thousand other people or film nerds in LA care, but the other 330 million people in America and 7 billion people around the planet don't know the difference and couldn't care less, right? Like they don't know what you shot it on. They don't care how many frames per second it is or whatever. You have to be able to just tell a compelling story. And if it's funny enough or thrilling enough or emotional enough, whatever, they'll forgive what it looks like. I mean, if you look at some of the most popular small, like Clerks, whatever, like it wasn't like Clerks looked amazing, but you know, it was funny and it did what it was supposed to do. So, so I do give kind of that caveat all the time where I'm like, I think people pay, in my opinion, and it's a very, my very humble opinion, because I know some people are camera heads and they love it and they're going to be so offended that I said that, but I don't think you need to concern yourself with that, that much. I mean, it needs to look good enough, especially these days, because you could shoot on your iPhone and it'll look good. So you can't nowadays have really an excuse to make something that looks terrible because why would you? But I think the difference between shooting on your iPhone and shooting on a red to most people is, is irrelevant. So I would, I would throw that out there to people who are looking to shoot something. And again, I, what do I know? I made one you know, small feature film, but that's, I have that opinion. 
that said, um, we shot on a Panasonic Lumix GH5. And I hope I put the GH and the five in the right order because I always mess that up because again, it's not my focus. Um, but I believe that's what it was. Um, and it was great. You know, I mean, it's again, it's a DSLR, it's 4K. Um, and I thought it looked really good. And, and, and my friend Godin was the guy who was the DP. Um, I thought did a great job. And again, this was shot very quickly with a few lights, you know, minimal kind of stuff, lots of takes. We had nobody who, we didn't even have someone doing the, the clapboard. We were kind of, we synced it up just with audio spikes and stuff. Really kind of fly by the seat of your pants as quickly as you can kind of stuff. Cause I'd be like another one, another one, another one when stuff wasn't working. So um, we didn't have a lot of time for setups and all that stuff, but I think it, you know, especially could be given the confined settings and how, how uh, repetitive and mundane it could have looked. I think, you know, well, he did a great job and, 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 you know, we make sure with the color at the end, we made sure to kind of emphasize the pop of the, of the colors and kind of make it as lively as possible also, which helped. That would look great. Yeah, no, I have to ask because I know somebody, every, every Q and A has no, that. Of course. Question. Yeah, of course. I know somebody. I'm telling you, some people are going to be like, what do you mean he doesn't care? Like they're going to be really mad at me for saying that. Yeah. I, I know for a fact, but. <laughs> You just lost fans. <laughs> yeah, my, all those fans I had before. <laughs> uh, you mentioned it earlier, but I think it, we should point it out that you wrote a book, you say, and that book is featured <laughs> in the film. <laughs> it is. It is. Uh, yeah, that's also a very long story of how it came to be. But yes, I had a book published. Um, it was published through a company in Maine called Cider Mill Press, but the distribution was through Simon & Schuster. So it was really a book that was everywhere in every bookstore and every like anywhere that sells books had it. Uh, and it's a parody of Curious George called By Curious George. Uh, and it's exactly what you would think that means. Um, it looks like a kid's book. It's definitely not a kid's book. Um, and it's, you know, it's kind of playing off the idea that, and I have kids, so I had revisited the Curious George books, you know, relatively recently that, um, there was always kind of this question of like, who's this guy in a yellow suit and a yellow hat that like goes to the jungle and like kidnaps a monkey and brings him to live with him in the city? Like what, there was always that underlying joke of like, what's up with this guy? What's really happening, right? That was always kind of out there. And so, and of course the label, the, the, the title just lends itself so kind of obviously to that joke, uh, Curious George by Curious George. And then that's what this book is. So it looks like a Curious George book, it actually follows, if you look at the original Curious George and you open them up next to each other, page by page, it actually follows the exact page and look in terms of like where the words are, you know, it's that kind of weird concrete poetry of words on Curious George, I'm not familiar with them, or, or where the images are because different images are in different parts of the page. It, it shadows it, it mimics it, it mirrors it, um, but with a very different kind of story about this, this monkey that comes to the big city and is curious and trying to get laid, but he can, and he doesn't understand what it means or whatever, and he's just trying to explore his his world and sexuality and it's very luckily it was very funny and um very well received by the lgbt community which which was a big not concern but a big issue for me to make sure that it kind of walked that line properly um and we were able to do that and i showed it to friends uh from that community you know while it was being written and developed to make sure if there was any questions in my mind of like is this work is this you know I, you know the worst thing it would be to do something like that and have it be really offensive or like upsetting or cross the line in the wrong way. And um, it was really well received and supported um, by the community. I got messages, not just even from organizations that were willing to support it, but even from individuals I knew or people I didn't know around the world who were like, you would find me on whatever, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and be like, just found this book. It's hilarious. I'm getting it for my coffee table. You know, my roommate and I are going to love it or I'm getting it for my brother who's gay, you know, whatever. So it really struck the right chord, luckily. And that was a lot of work too, because it was, um, I don't know how long you want me to talk about this, but it was illustrated in China uh, with a really great illustrator who could mimic the look of Curious George. Um, and I told him what I wanted, but it was all through email. And like the first versions of the images that I had kind of outlined to him that came back looked like Curious George, but they were so over the top that it was like, you know, the man with the yellow hat was originally, he's like in a Speedo with a boa around his neck and like that. And I was like, that's not, what I'm imagining, right? Like that's going too far. I, I live in LA, I work in entertainment. I know a lot of people in the LGBTQ plus community and that's not how it works, right? They're not walking around with boas and speedos, right? Like there are certain touch points that you can make fun of in the right way and it'll be hilarious to them, but you can't be, you know, dumb about it for lack of a better word. So it took a lot of 
going back and forth and saying, no, it can't be this, I want it to be that. And luckily, yeah, luckily it worked. Well, I just thought it was a funny gag in the film. And then I found out afterwards that you'd written the book. So it was kind of nice that you were able to stick it in there like that. I wonder Yeah, I was like, ooh, free advertising, <laughs> you know, because <laughs> of all the people that are going to see this movie. So who knows? But it was just, it kind of worked. And I thought it was funny to put it in there. I wonder if there's anything else in the film that has more of a story to it than we know, than we realize. I mean, probably. I mean, a lot of jokes and references are, are probably things that were from my college days and jokes and just things that are funny to me and um you know like my daughter baked the red velvet cake she gets a credit at the end as a red velvet cake baker uh so there's a lot of little you know it's shot of my house also so like everything is in my life or part of my life or whatever in some way you know there's a lot of Simonian, as it gets a lot of Simonian credits there's yeah a- well yeah there's me who you know wore 50 different hats and i tried not to i didn't want to be the guy who was like i gave myself 30 credits in the credits you know because theoretically i was everything i was locations and everything um but yeah I, my wife helped my daughter helped my son helped. my parents like the coffee shop scenes my parents backyard and um my mom's even in the movie as one of the people sitting there kind of sh- shell-shocked by what's happening at the coffee shop so like they got extra credits and location thank yous and you know yeah there's a lot of a lot of not just simonian credits but a lot of armenian people i realized credits uh just because that's you know part of my community and people that were willing to help so is there a community there in la that of armenian people yeah yeah it's huge here and 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 um I grew up very much, and even in Philadelphia, I grew up very much in that community. In my school, my grade school was an Armenian private school, and my church was an Armenian church, and my camp was an Armenian camp. I was just talking to a friend about this, about how, like, I mean, I think you can tell I'm very American, but, like, I grew up, like, totally embedded in this Armenian community. Like, everyone I knew was Armenian until I was, like, 12 years old. Um, and and it's a tight-knit community, and, and you know, luckily, friends help friends, and, and it just kind of worked out. So even, like, my extras were, like, my parents, and then my nephew who's our, you know, has my same last name. And then he brought one friend with him. Sorry, this is our phone ringing. Um, and that guy happened to be Armenian, even though my nephew has like no Armenian friends, like randomly the one Armenian kid he knew came with him to be the bartender, the, the barista. And then another family brought the wife and daughters to be extras also, all in the same scene. There's only one scene with extras. Um, so I realized that there's this list of extras, like thank you to the extras and they're all, it's my parents, my nephew, <laughs> another Armenian kid, and three Armenian people. I was like, oh, this is so, like, so classically Armenian. Like, everyone's Armenian. And, like, you know, normally it's embarrassing. Like, oh, what have I done? But that's how it worked out. And they were they were there to help. So I appreciate it. Um, so you're showing your film now. And I'm wondering, and you're, you're putting it in the film festivals. Do you have any other plans? I mean, you know, I think there's a, unfortunately a difference between hopes and plans. Um, I have a lot of hopes, uh, hope. plans. I feel like, again, I'm, I'm coming at this from someone who's been in Hollywood for two decades, right? Like I've sold shows all over the United States, every cable network, every broadcast network, I've developed stuff that's been everywhere um, on the reality side, but still it's the same general world. Um, so I kind of know how it works. And, and after I finished this movie, um, I was able to show it to a bunch of people who I know in their in agency. I, you know, I worked at William Morris. I was repped at CAA. I was repped at APA. Like, uh, you know, I, I have friends everywhere. Uh, and a lot of people liked it, but I think what was interesting was, and it was a little bit of a, you, I was kind of hoping it wouldn't have this response, but I wasn't surprised that they did, is that a lot of people were like, I like it. I just don't know, what do I, I don't know what to do with it, right? Like, it's funny, but it's still just like a small movie with no stars. So I think ultimately it's going to have to go through the festival circuit. You know, the hope would be like the right person sees it and they love it. And suddenly you're directing Jurassic World, right? Like that's the the dream, but easier said than done, right? So um, I think it's going to have to go through the festival circuit and, and hopefully gets into festivals like Kansas City, where there's, you know, like I said, a track record and there's a respectable pull to it. And it's like, it actually means something. Um, in addition to all the other festivals that hopefully, you know, are, are also just as valid, but you know, you want the biggest names, et cetera, because you kind of need, you need that recognition. You need that. It's really just like an affirmation from the film community, which for better or worse, whether it makes sense or not is important. And so, you know, if it can get that recognition, if it can get that buzz, if it can continue to 
do well on the circuit and get into bigger and you know more big festivals like uh, you know that that the community that the Hollywood community actually looks at or attends or whatever, uh, even though everything's virtual this year. You know, I hope it has a life. I, I hope that you know there's somebody who would say yes. I think this merits distribution in whatever capacity. You know, I, I don't have any illusions that it's going to be on three thousand screens. You know, next to Godzilla versus Kong, but like. I think it's funny and I think it merits, hopefully people will, will, someone will want people to see it and think that there's an economic, you know, system that would make that work. Cause that's really what it is, right? If people think they're going to make money, they'll do it. And if they don't, they won't. Um, no one's going to do it out of the kindness of their heart. So I've talked to, I have friends that are at distributors and I've shown it to them and talked to them. Again, not, not telling them, hey, buy this movie because I don't think they would because it doesn't make any sense. But if I could come back to them and say, Hey, listen, it won an award at Kansas City and it won an award at X, Y, and Z. Now there's something that, you know, they need a reason to be able to tell their boss, hey, let's buy it. And to tell audiences, hey, of all the options you have that are at your fingertips constantly right now, click on this. And here's why it won an award here, 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 here. And at least they feel like there's a reason people might see it and, and you know, spend the time or money to, to watch it. And so, I, you know, plans wise, I hope it does well enough to get that conversation. If not, you know, there, there are ways to self-distribute in terms of like, you can, you can put it on Amazon and rent it for $1.99 or sell it for $3.99. You can do whatever you want. Uh, and maybe that's what it'll end up being, you know, if, if the gods don't smile on us enough, but I'll kind of cross that bridge when I come to it. And again, there are companies that help with that, that I've spoken to. And it's the same question. If I do that, you know, how do you drive people to why are they going to click on this movie they've never heard of? So, you know, there's a whole, and I got into this a little bit with the mobile applications of like Facebook advertising, you know, Google ads, but there's a whole economics to that as well. That's its own weird world that I'm not, not even nearly an expert on, but you might have to get into that to then try to drive traffic so that people will actually watch your movie, et cetera. So, you know, it's, it's a, it's not the greatest answer, but I think it's a very realistic one. I hope, you know, something magic happens and, you know, neon picks it up or a24 or whoever like gravitas you know whatever but like is that realistic i don't know we'll see we'll see i hope so what about what about plans for yourself will you go on to make yeah film? Yeah. yeah i mean that's that's certainly you know the way i look at this project is uh it's it's two sides to the coin so there's the movie itself which is what i kind of just spoke about which is like i hope the movie has a life i hope lots of people see it if it can actually make money all the better uh, I mean, it only costs 3,500 bucks, so it shouldn't be that hard theoretically to make money, but, you know, still easier said than done. Um, I think that'd be awesome. I, I hope, you know, it lives online forever and becomes a cult classic and people laugh, you know, laugh about it. Separate from that is, um, yeah, my, you know, I had made it more also as a calling card to be like, hey, you know, you know me as a TV guy, here's a feature film. Um, and I was able to make it on a shoestring budget, you know, I kind of wore all the hats and still I think we were able to make something that, you know, I believe and luckily, you know, Kansas City Film Fest thought was good enough to merit some attention. So, you know, as a calling card, it's it's been helpful, but I still think it needs, you know, it still goes into that same boat where the movie needs to um, get enough buzz that people care to see it and then people will see it and say, oh, you know, so like everyone who sees it likes it, it certainly started opening more and more conversations and more and more doors for me. Uh, and there's already one project, someone saw the movie and liked it, who I've known for years, but we haven't really been in touch very much. And she's an actress, who's a well-known actress that um, she wants me to, and I'm now writing something for her that we might shoot. So that's a small example of the domino effect of what I hope this movie would do. So it's already started a little, which is great news. Um, Again, who knows what that'll amount to, but if that's good, then it'll lead to the next conversation, et cetera. And that's the process for, you know, if I'm trying to get my company and me into the feature side of things after being on TV and mobile and consulting and publishing and all that other stuff, features was always kind of the goal anyway. I think this is how it has to go. You know, it's short of trying to raise $2 million to make a bigger movie, which would take five years to try to even raise. Um, I just wanted to go out and do it. So I just kind of went out and did it and, and now, we'll see what that amounts to, but it seems like good things are happening. So hopefully, you know, if you talk to me in a year, there'll be even better news. Well, I like that the two guys end up together at the end, um, yeah. hanging out. So maybe, and I'd, and I'd love to see them again, together again, some more. So maybe there's a possibility there. The sequel, maybe. <laughs> I mean, we had a lot of fun 
uh, making this movie. So I certainly wouldn't discount that. But I'd love to do it again. So, yeah, I think they're all talented people worth paying attention to. So um, anyway, I guess that's all the questions I've got for you. And, okay. and we got a pretty good little chat going here. So uh, I just want to thank you again for joining us or joining me, I guess, and whoever's watching eventually this video. So thank you for coming to the Kansas City Film Fest virtually and sharing your uh, film with us. So yeah, absolutely. Thank you for not only this interview, but for the festival in general and, you know, uh, making my selecting my film and letting it be a part of it. It's it's super exciting. And I'm very appreciative. And uh, hopefully we'll meet in person at some point. That'd be nice. Hopefully next time you can make it to Kansas City. <laughs> Absolutely. So, all right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye.